So hello there guys and welcome back to a brand new episode of the DNF1 F1 podcast. I hope that you guys are doing well and staying safe as always. And we are back. The DNF1 panel are back in full. We've got the band back together guys and we are going to be going through the big stories going into the 2023 season. And if anything was what 2022 was to go by, I'm pretty sure that 2023 is going to be even more exciting. But as mentioned already, joining me on the show, the first time in 2023, the DNF1 team are in full force. We have Courtney Pine all ready to go. Lee Wannington as well. Guys, happy new year to you both. Courtney, I'm going to start with you because, of course, Mm -hmm. you've had a bit of an upgrade in equipment. I have. How are you feeling and uh, how was the break for you? How was your uh, Christmas? Did you enjoy yourself? First of all, I just need to say one thing because it's been a while. Reunited and it feels so good. <laughs> <laughs> had to be done. It's been a while, so I had to start off with a cheesy intro. Um, It's been, yeah, it's been a great Christmas. Um, Feeling refreshed. Really happy with um, how the channel's been going lately and ready and pumped to... uh. Push on to a thousand subs and looking forward to what is hopefully a fantastic season. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you, mate. And of course, we are pushing for a thousand subscribers on our YouTube channel. We're not too far away from 900, but of course, guys, you can always support us by liking the video, subscribing to the channel, share it with anybody that is new or hasn't heard of us before, might be interested. Um, you know, unlike a few of our favorite podcasters out there in the F1 community, we are staying put. We're not going anywhere. And of course, we're referring to the legendary Matt Gallagher and Tom Bellingham. But of course, best of luck to those guys. But we are staying put here at DNF1. So uh, I think we're going to have some fun with this one for a while yet. Yeah. Lee, happy new year to you, mate. How are you doing? And uh, yeah, how was your winter break? Do you enjoy yourself? Thank you, Adam. Um, happy New Year to you too. I enjoyed myself as best as I can. I ate and drank uh, a bit too much from both accounts, but that's part of the fun, isn't it? And that's obviously, what it's all just about. Uh, exactly. on Courtney singing. I'm sure Carlos signs if he heard it would be proud of your uh, smooth <laughs> operator sort of uh, singing that. There's a get, duet get, I can get behind. That's it. <laughs> I'm getting I'm getting cocky with this new uh, with this new setup. I might need to be humbled. Oh, no, no, no. We, no time for humbling on this show. Absolutely. Unless it comes my way, but uh, fair enough. But yeah, of course, guys, you know, if you want to enjoy more Courtney singing and if you're listening to this on the audio platforms, you know what to do to support us there. Give us a five star review. If you think that we are worthy, we'll give you a shout out on the next episode. And we really, really would appreciate you guys supporting us in this. I know we say it a lot, but we really do uh, appreciate every single one of you that supports on this show. We need more support, of course. We want this podcast to go out to more people in 2023. 2022 was a great year for us, but we know with your support, 2023 can be even better. And given by some of the guests that I've already had on this show this year and more that I've got lined up for the year ahead, especially before the start of the season, we are really stacked with some great content coming your way. You definitely don't want to miss out on that. So make sure you subscribe, follow us where you listen to your podcast or watch them. If you're a YouTube subscriber as well, make sure to get in there and join the DNF1 family. We've got plenty to look forward to this year. Starting of which, guys, I think the best place to start for 2023 in terms of covering the big F1 stories is Ferrari. Big change at the helm for Ferrari this season. Matti Bonotto resigning from the team principal role. And in truth, it was definitely one of those roles where he was more pushed um, or more push to resign rather than getting the chop. And a lot has been said about Matti Bonotto last season, whether or not he was the right man to take Ferrari to the ultimate glory of winning a world championship. They put together a great car under his leadership, which challenged for the championship in the first half of the season, got a couple of race wins. According to Bonotto, it was where he wanted Ferrari to be at this point is where he expected Ferrari to be so in some ways it probably was a little bit unfair for him to be pushed out of the door before ultimately he resigned and now he's been replaced by Frederick Vasseur the former Alfa Romeo CEO and team principal making that jump to Marinello it's a big big job so I guess guys seven weeks to go until the season gets underway can Fred Vasseur whip this Ferrari team into shape eradicate the mistakes that Ferrari were plagued with last season on strategy, for example, amongst many others, and also enjoy a car that can compete in 2023, perhaps even more so than it did in 2022. 
Um, we've been here before, and Ferrari fans are going to hate me for saying this, but they're going to need to be patient. Now, they've probably heard this once or twice over the last 15 years, but they're going to have to give him time to settle in because we've seen it many, many times with Ferrari with this whole sort of chopping block approach they have. They did give um, Bonotto a, a fair amount of time, to be fair, but with that patience, they developed a card that was at least at the beginning of the season challenging for a championship. So they've already got the concept that they, you know, again, started well. They just need to develop it, but they also need to give for Sir time because with any change in management, you need to give him time to settle in, run the operation in a way that suits him. And with that, you are going to get teething problems. So if Ferrari start off slow off the buck, off the blocks don't panic again <laughs> I think Ferrari fans have uh they've had their fair share of trauma over the last 15 years so the natural reaction is to panic but give for sir time I, I I think the the starting point there for Ferrari you know well and truly they're ready to go they're ready to challenge but on the flip side to that F1 is such a fast moving machine let's say and sometimes it's so easy to get you know left behind by your opposition so it is a bit of a tough one for Ferrari right now you you expect Mercedes to come back strong Red Bull I still believe are going to be the team to beat in 2023 and there are other teams that are hoping to challenge in the near future particularly with the 2026 regulations coming along we're going to have new um, new teams possibly with Andretti new manufacturers that are not in just to make up the numbers we've we've heard from the likes of Audi that are really keen to push on and become a championship contender so it is important that Ferrari don't rely on their name and their history because Formula One is a ruthless animal so they will want to be cracking on and making a, a quick impact but at the same time they need to give us a, a bit of time in order for things to work out for the team. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, patience is not something we often associate with Ferrari. I mean, this is a team that have gone, what is it now, 15 years since they won a world title. Seems like an eternity for a lot of Ferrari fans. It seems like that to me, you know, watching on. I I have to sort of pinch myself and remind myself of how long ago it it really was. It makes me feel old and uh, certainly not enjoying waiting. Yeah, that is true. You know, uh, must admit uh, it's not ideal. It's certainly not certainly not kids anymore that's uh one thing we could say but yeah it has been a long time for ferrari but patience is key and that is something that perhaps was not given to binotto it was not afforded to him the pressure started to ramp up in the second half of last season the strategy mistakes occurred regularly reliability was a problem that ferrari were plagued with um and and it just showed when ferrari fell a long way from being in the championship fight that we fought at one point of the season early on that it was theirs to lose Lee, talking of the Sir, you know, we mentioned only a short amount of time before preseason testing gets underway and the season. It's not a lot of time to make the changes that he would want to put forward to turn Ferrari into a championship winning team. But I suppose if there is anything that you can think of that for Sir needs to focus on first, what would it be in your mind? Is it more strategy or perhaps something else? Uh, I think for. Fred, the first first thing that he would need to focus on would be actually Charles. Um, yes, for I um, um, operational made mistakes and needs to work on, but operational changes take time to implement. You obviously have to explain and then train and then deal with any resistance from the team because people don't like change. Um, so that is a long term process, as Courtney touched on. But Charles is something that Fred already has an established relationship with. He can um, try and reset him, get him for the year, get his headspace in a good game. Uh, and be, I've got your back. I'm not your enemy. Not that ben- Benotto was, but there were there weren't a great relationship between the two. And it's all about, which I think one of the reasons why he was brought in is about that relationship with Charles. So the first, that's the first thing he will be trying to smooth and set the expectations and nurture and keep calm in the season as we get towards testing is going to be all about Charles. Yeah, absolutely. And I think 
from what we saw last season, Charles Leclerc certainly did up his game. There were obvious mistakes that he made when the pressure really started to ramp up for him. And that's something, by his own admission, that he would want to improve next season. Have a bit of an arm round the shoulder rather than a wagging finger telling him off, as we saw with Bonotto at the end of the race at Silverstone, where he was very much reminding Charles that this is a team effort and that you're not bigger than the team. But ultimately, it did seem like a slippery slope every time they were trying to meet up to reconvene and try and get back on good terms with Fred Vasseur you're going to get someone that's going to be that arm around the shoulder, someone that's going to nurture his talent, someone that knows him very, very well from his junior career days and obviously gave him his opportunity racing in Formula One with what was then the Sauber team. And hopefully for them, it will transpire into something special. Um, We will talk about Carlos Sainz in a moment, but I do want to focus on the car because the car was a huge talking point last season. It's It came out of the blocks very, very quickly. It was... Definitely the best car in the field for at least the first half of the season. Reliability was a problem. Now, I'd been hearing reports over the winter from Italy, from Maranello, that Ferrari have found solutions to these reliability issues that have plagued them last season. Now, of course, with the engine regulations, with the engine freeze until 2026, you can only make certain adjustments to your engine, your power unit, if you like, that improve reliability. And as a result, Ferrari claim that... In order for them to finish the season, they had to turn down their engines by such a degree that it cost them around three tenths of a second per lap. Now, on its own, if that is true, that's a huge amount of lap time that Ferrari were given up. Assuming that this is true, of course, and we know Ferrari, they're usually, usually very buoyant. And sometimes, with regarding their expectations, they are prone to a little exaggeration. Not necessarily based on the fact that they're telling fibs or porkies or anything like that. More down to the fact that perhaps Ferrari overestimating their expectations. But if we take that get that deficit alone, add that to the car that they had and add the usual gains that a team was usually gaining in the off-season, without anything else in addition, guys, that sounds like a recipe for a very good car in 2023. On its own, that could be enough to put them back in, in par with Red Bull, Courtney. No, it is. It's, it's certainly encouraging. And um, another story I saw circling is that they seem to have found the uh, solution to the weight issues. There was also a big burden on the car. I think another thing that uh, blighted Ferrari in the second half of the season was the tyre performance. And they believed that it was mainly down to the weight of the car. So in theory, if you put both of those aspects together, they could be taken off a lot of, a lot of, you know, a lot of the time, the blight of the car in the second half of the season. Obviously, the caveat that comes into it is the fact that Red Bull are definitely going to find ways. We've had we've had talk of Red Bull developing a new lightweight sh- sh- uh, yeah, chassis that could obviously make the car a lot faster. Mercedes also seem to have found some solutions to the issues that blighted them last season. So it'd be interesting to see how you know these new developments from Ferrari help in sort of comparison to the other teams. But look, I think. You putting those two things together, Ferrari fans do have a reason to be excited. I'll be honest, talking about this is making me sort of excited for testing. So it's about five weeks away, isn't it? Yeah, it's not too far away. I mean, the point of recording this, it's 54 days away from lights out. For anyone following our little (laughs) Twitter countdown to the F1 season, and uh, for those of you that aren't, follow us on DNF1 Official on Twitter. Every day we do a little countdown for each day towards the F1 season and we post a little factoid regarding that particular number. I think the one today uh, that we put up 54 days to go, it would have been about Jim Clark winning the 1963 Belgian Grand Prix by four minutes and 54 seconds, which is an outright record, one that probably won't ever be beat in terms of a winning margin. And uh, imagine that was a race in the modern day. I mean, people complaining about boring runaway leaders. I mean, (laughs) Jim was on another level at that point. It was absolutely astonishing. So, yeah, follow us on Twitter to uh, get a new one every single day as we count down to the F1 season. But you're right, Corny, you know, preseason testing is not too far away as well. As I said, not a lot of time for Fred Vasseur to get his protocols in order. There is some reason to suggest that he may just let Ferrari do what they need to do and then intervene where necessary, mm-hmm. you know, not try to uh, reinvent the wheel, if you like. Because I think despite the fact that Bonotto, you know, had ultimately gone and, you know, people like John Elkin and Benedetta Bigner, um, uh, should be the other way around, actually, I pronounced that wrong. But this, you know, the new CEO at Ferrari, Benedetta Vigna, that's right. 
weren't really Bonotto fans. You know, Bonotto was a Camilleri appointment. He was someone that, well, he was a Camilleri, you know, supporter. Uh, Marchione, the late Sergio Marchione, was the one that appointed him in the role. And, you know, from then on then, it, the writing was almost on the wall. It was almost as if, like, if this car doesn't win a world championship, it becomes a victim of its own success and Bonotto mm-hmm. ends up getting the chop for it. So, in a way, I just feel that perhaps a Fred Vasseur, he doesn't necessarily need to change too much too soon. I think he just needs to see where this plays and then intervene where necessary and see where it goes. It, it does seem on the surface that they're going to have a good car Ferrari. We don't know that for sure. But if Ferrari are correct, they've eradicated these issues with the power unit. And as you said, Courtney, this will help with tyre wear as well, not just losing the weight of the car and getting to that weight limit, which we didn't hear Ferrari talk about very often, but obviously that's a good sign. But having a better engine means they won't have to lean on the tyres as much to try and recover okay. some of that performance that they'd lost. And obviously they were running less downforce on the car to try and bring back the straight line speed that they'd lost as a result of turning the engines down. So that in turn will help then with tyre wear and tyre management, something that they struggled with a lot last season and really hurt them over the race distance. Lee, we'll come back to you on this one. Um, you know, Courtney and I have obviously talked about the car for next season, what we do know, at least, or what we've heard from Ferrari. What are your thoughts on this one? Is that enough to be optimistic about for Ferrari? Or do you feel that we just have to wait and see until the season starts before we get excited? I, th- I think it's optimistic for Ferrari. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, Adam, they started last year with a uh, championship contending car. Yes, they it fell away from the season went on, but they started the season. So it, it, it I would imagine it would be very likely that they start the season with a, a title contending car. The real question is if they will be able to maintain it throughout the year. But starting the season, I definitely think there'll be uh, you know, a title contention. It, it almost sounds like even if Ferrari produce a good car, the cynical side of me worries that they'll just throw away an even more competitive car that could win a world championship than what they did last year. I mean, in fairness to Ferrari, even if they'd got everything right on strategy, they still would have come second best to Red Bull. You know, Red Bull were brilliant at what they did and ultimately were so good. And and we should be fair to Ferrari too. I mean, I say that in jest, hoping that it actually doesn't happen. Hope Ferrari have a great season, of course, my own interest, not just the ones of the sport when that they want Ferrari involved, but there were times where Ferrari did make good strategy calls. You know, Abu Dhabi was a great example where they put Charles onto a one-stopper. Charles wasn't sure if it was going to work, but he committed to it, got him ahead of Perez, and, you know, it caused problems because they didn't want to risk Verstappen going for a two-stop as well. So they had to leave him out on a one-stopper too. So there are times when Ferrari do get it right. But then there are times, like what we saw this season in Hungary, where they put them on the hard tyres, which cost them the race win in that regard. Um, we also had the Brazilian Grand Prix in qualifying where they had Charles on the inters. I mean, I can name so many, but just a few there. Those are the things where Ferrari do have to make the right calls at the right time. And if they do have an even more competitive car this season, it really is going to hinge on whether Ferrari can capitalise on that. Do you know what? I think another thing, again, it's looking at the opposition. I think sometimes we forget because the Red Bull last season was so much faster than their competitors in the uh, latter end of the season. Let's not forget about how almost flawless Red Bull were with obviously Verstappen. Verstappen was in the league of his own last season and also the strategy. They were so good with strategy last season. And it, it just the reason why I bring it up is because Ferrari don't only need to be better. They're going to, have to be almost flawless because Red Bull really did set the standard when it comes to strategy last season. Yeah, I think so too. And it's something Mercedes and t- as well will also have to look at for next season if they're in a similar position to Ferrari in terms of being competitive against Red Bull. Um, quick word on Carlos Sainz because we haven't mentioned him yet. Last season, I think, was a, v- a very much a learning experience, one that he grew as the season went on. He started off really much, uh, very much on the back foot. This wasn't a car that he got adjusted to very quickly. As the season grew and went on, he did get stronger, he did get faster, he did get more comfortable, constantly nipping at the heels of his teammate, and he was relentless in doing that to a point where he was looking very consistent. Kind of the opposite, in a way, to Charles, where he was fast out of the gates, but lacked that consistency in the difficult moments later on. For Carlos Sainz, This is going to be another difficult season for them. One, he will have to step up. One, you could argue he may have to go alone against the the interest of his teammate and his new team principal, who a lot of people in F1 have already suspected 
that his appointment was based on the fact that he was very much a child of Claire sympathizer. So with all that being said and speculated, where do we see Carlos signs in 2023? Is this a season where he's just going to have to step up or will he just be what he was last season and be a consistent guy, but on his day can win a race, but not quite as often as you perhaps like. I think if, if Carlos signs wants to be a world champion, this is going to be his best chance. If he steals the initiative at Ferrari, say Charles Leclerc continues to struggle and you know, has more fallings out within the team, I don't think that's going to happen. It's going to be a tough task for Carlos. But yeah, if he wants to be a world champion, I really do believe it's going to be his best chance because Formula One, again, is such a fast-moving machine. You're, all, you're only as good as your last race. So Carlos needs to build his reputation, the trust on his side of the garage. And really go for it because you just feel that if he falters in his Ferrari team, his stock's going to drop. And that he, say he chooses to move on. Like but the way we saw with Dan Ricciardo, I think Dan Ricciardo is a perfect example of a guy that was well respected within the sport, was in a race winning car. Max Verstappen come along, you know, took the team to the next level. And before he knew it, his stock fell. He made, you know, one or two mistakes in terms of moves and when to make them. And now he's a reserve driver. So it just shows how important it is to grasp your opportunities when you have them in this ball. Yeah, very, very true. Uh, Lee, quick one on signs. What are you hoping for him to do this season? What does Carlos signs need to do this season? Well, I, I would, firstly, I would agree with Courtney. That's his best chance. But I do think that Carlos needs to step up. Uh, not that he's done a bad job. Obviously, he started last season poorly. So if he starts this season without any mistakes avoiding gravel traps because he'd like doing that early on last season um, and then he can bring back solid points obviously if he goes out the gate he gets pole position race win and he repeats that a couple of times I'm not saying he will do that but if he repeats that a couple of times and he establishes himself in the team look you can all do it, any team order you want I'm ahead if he's in that position then obviously he's in the power seat and he can justify internally like you can't um, put me as second fiddle you have to pick me so obviously for a car perspective what I want to see him out is he may, he doesn't have the right speed of Charles mm-hmm. but he has the brains to put himself in the position and maintain it if the opportunity comes along yeah uh, absolutely so yeah he needs to increase his the amount of opportunities he gets to use his strengths yeah no I agree with you uh, very much on that one I was just going to say that last season Carlos several times went against what Ferrari were instructing him to do and more often than not it actually turned out to be the right call on his part something that not even Charles Leclerc himself has been able to get behind and and get his head around last season probably something that plagued him and as I said with Carlos he's very relentless he will nip at the heels he'll keep working hard the start of last season I think a lot of people underestimated how difficult it was for him to get up to speed but once he was there he was a factor in every single race, relatively speaking. If Ferrari have an equally competitive car at the start of the season as they did last year, maybe even more competitive, perhaps, if things go as they hope they will, Carlos is definitely in the hunt. And I think it's something that Ferrari will definitely have to manage next season. It it definitely won't be the Charles Leclerc show that perhaps some people at Maranello may be hoping for. But we'll move on to the next story, and that's at Mercedes. Now, a lot of people last season us included, were incredibly surprised at how far off the pace Mercedes, in fact, were. And ultimately, I think what that came down to was not necessarily just the concept of their car, but they designed a car that was going to run very low to the ground and optimise the new ground effect technology that these cars are very much built around in their design. And one of the problems that we all saw last season that practically everybody was affected by to some degree was porpoising. And Mercedes were very much affected by the porpoising issue so much more than everybody else where they had to run their cars a little bit higher. We had the new technical directed with the flexi floors that some people believed very much was pushed for by Mercedes to try and level up the playing field or at least help them. It did to a degree. Um, Not, you know, we talk about the top two teams, Red Bull unaffected by it. If anything, it helped Mm -hmm. them even more. Ferrari claimed that they weren't affected by it. I'm not convinced. I think they were They just wanted to be a bit coy about it. But it did affect other teams in the midfield as well. It allowed Mercedes to get away from those teams in the midfield that they did struggle at the start of the season to break away from. I remember races in 
Bahrain and in um, in Austria where they were racing against the Husses on merit, you know, and that was a combination of Mercedes struggling and Huss being very impressive at the time. They want to be far away from that battle as they can this season. So a lot has been said in the winter break. You know, Toto Wolf, I think, was on the Beyond the Grid podcast. He talked about the devil in the detail. A lot of what's going to improve with Mercedes next season is going to be down to what's underneath the hood rather than what we can see. So perhaps that alludes to the car being relatively similar to what we saw last year. So they're not abandoning the Hyde Pod concept that our friend Bryson Sullivan um, introduced to us when he was on the show before. And hopefully for Mercedes that they will be able to be back at the front. They claim as well uh, to add to this that they were able to simulate porpoising in the wind tunnel on their new car. So hopefully the W14 will be able to cope with that effect a lot better than others. Whether or not that will be eradicated from uh, the grid or not, we'll have to wait and see. But what are you guys' thoughts on this one for Mercedes? This is a big year. Do you think that they are going to find a way to turn this car into a race winner again? Or are they going to struggle with another diva-like car as they did with the W13 in 2022? Lee, I want to come to you first on that one. Um, I think they could they could turn the well last year's car was already a race winner. Um least forget. But the I think they will have a, at least a race winning car this season. Um obviously another thing that Toto said that he had mentioned was that last year the, the amount of bouncing, as they like to call it, was severely damaging their engines. They had to run it on a reduced power, especially in the first part of the season, but it went throughout the season and they've had to make some changes to the engine to improve reliability. Um, and you know, manufacturers like to sneak in performance under the guise of reliability as much as the FAA like to stop that. Manufacturers find a way to increase it with the help of reliability. And the, the thing that makes me wonder is Mercedes already had the most reliable engine last season and they turned it down because of the bouncing. Um, so what changes have they made to make potentially make it better? Although they, they're not supposed to because it's only reliable. But even if the car is not the fastest aerodynamic, because Red, I fully expect Red Bull to to probably have the best aeros, uh, but the engine could be their surprise secret weapon that catches Honda or Red Bull powertrains, whichever you want to call it now, a bit by surprise. Well, this is the thing, and you know the the rear. I can I can say right now, I'm expecting almost every team on the grid to abandon their break, uh, their rear suspension and copy what Red Bull did last year. Because yeah, I think yeah. that was one thing that... Um, I remember Craig Scarborough telling me about this when we had him on the show, that Red Bull had a brilliant design on their <laughs> rear suspension and it could force almost everybody else on the grid to copy it because of how it allowed them to deal with the porpoising issue so well. And this is something that Mercedes apparently are going to try and do. They had issues with the brake separation as well at the front end where George Russell was very, very much... Uh, complaining about these brake issues. They obviously had the drag problems as well, which plagued them last season. As you mentioned, Lee, they had to turn the engine down because the car was being damaged on the underfloor because of the porpoising. So there's a lot, really, that Mercedes needs to fix. And I suppose we're going to find out in pre-season or at the first race if Mercedes have resolved this one. But one thing I think we can draw positives on from Mercedes, which could give Mercedes fans optimism for 2023 is they did take a huge step forward. And I think once they figured out how to deal with the porpoising issues, they were, as you said, Lee, a race-winning team. They won the Brazilian Grand Prix. They were by far the best team that weekend. And, you know, they very much deserved the one-two finish. George Russell was brilliant on the day. If anything, Lewis was a little bit quicker. He just wasn't able to pull it all together in the same way that George did. So there is reason to be optimistic at Mercedes. I think a lot of people are going to be asking the question, if this car turns out to be a car that is capable of winning races, will we see that at the start of the season? Or is it more likely we'll see a Mercedes that in the past we've seen be such a diva of a car where we have to find out the right working window, which takes half a season to find it. And when we do, it's a world beater. But the problem is the championship could be over by then for them if we see what Red Bull did last season. Corny, what are your thoughts on Mercedes for next season? Do you feel optimistic that they can get back? And if so, how long do you reckon it will take them? I think they will. I think they will be in the mix. I completely agree with what you said there, Lee. They will definitely be a race-winning car. 
I don't feel we're going to get the answer to your question, though, Adam, until testing. We all know that teams come along with little innovations and new concepts that can catch other teams by surprise. We thought we were going to get that with the Hyde, Hyde pod last season. We thought, oh, here we go. They've done it again. This is going to be... Um, what was, the, what was the system they bought in in 2020 that they got outlawed? What was it called? Das. That's yeah. it. Das. Um, we, we know that that played a big part in the 2020 card being as dominant as it was, for example. So we won't get the answers to that. I know that even if they are behind at the beginning of the season, I feel they'll be able to catch up you know, a lot more faster than they did last season. But you're right, Adam. It's just a case of if they are behind, how long is it going to take for them to catch up? My only concern for Mercedes is that the fact they were playing catch up could be an issue because Ferrari and Red Bull in particular will have a lot more better understanding of the concept they've been running because they had the luxury of having a faster car. So it just all depends on how much work Mercedes have put in to not only improve last year's car, which we proved to work well at the end of the season, but has the amount of hard work they put in at the beginning of the season, um, at the end of the season, sort of hampered the 2023 car? It's just a question whether it's helped or hampered this year's concept. Yeah, and I think one thing we have to look out for is how this car is going to look. I mean, it was so unique. It was the only team that went down the design route that it did. A lot of people said that they did consider that, but obviously decided to abandon it. Perhaps it was because of the issues with porpoising that affected Mercedes, where they just didn't want to run the car that low. So I'm kind of intrigued to see how this car is going to look in 2023. I mean, if I mean, is there a fear that Mercedes may try to go too far in copying what perhaps Red Bull or Ferrari have done, which may in turn hinder their own progress for 2023? Because it's certainly something you can't rule out, despite a lot of what Mercedes is saying being the opposite, really, where they're going to stick to what they did. Well, the I would, I've said it before that you can't win to win in Formula One. You can't copy rely, rely on just copying a competitor because you only have the same machinery what they have, where they can always be one step ahead. Um, so Mercedes is going to be aware of that, and as Courtney already touched on that, they they're known for innovating odd or different, if you want to put it. Um, aerodynamic tool sets or suspension that other teams just haven't thought of. So although you mentioned about the suspension, Mercedes may copy that. I wouldn't be surprised if they've got some new trick up their sleeve that they've catch the other teams off guard. Yeah, I suppose we'll have to wait and see. As I said, devil was in the detail, but it's certainly a car that I'm very much looking forward to seeing because I think of all the teams on the grid right now, they're the one that could potentially be the one that changes the most from 2022 but as I said you know it, we'll have to wait and see and is that a good idea perhaps not in a rule set like this but you know we'll have to wait and see um let's talk about George Russell and Sir Lewis Hamilton a lot was said between these two last season not really many occasions where they clashed if any at all but this is a potential rivalry that could be brewing for the longer that they are together and you know when we did our season review we all rated Hamilton to have had the slightly better season than George Russell despite the fact that George Russell had outscored Lewis and also got a race win where Lewis for the first time in his career went a whole season without winning a Grand Prix and a lot of people didn't necessarily agree with that they thought there was the old Hamilton bias coming in and that oh you know we can't say the young pretender in George Russell but sometimes you know, sometimes having the most points doesn't necessarily mean that you were better than your opponent. I mean, look at Ocon and Alonso, for example. I don't think many people would have said Ocon did a better job last season than Fernando Alonso, but the records would suggest that he beat Fernando Alonso. So there is a difference there. Um, what do you guys think? Do you think that's a fair assessment regarding Hamilton Russell? Do you think it was fair that we put Hamilton above Russell? Only slightly, mind you, but mm. in terms of our overall review. I think if you have a look at the Hamilton um, Russell uh, friendship, let's say, I I feel it'll be heavily strange if Mercedes produce at least a race winning car. Um, you see, with George Russell, he's gaining confidence. He's won his first race. I think that was a big deal for him. 
Lewis is obviously keen to get that eighth world championship. He's going to be, you know, particularly keen after what happened in 2021. I think George has settled into the team well because obviously he was a part of the um a part a part of the team for a long time. So the settling process didn't take take as long for him as maybe compared to another driver joining the team would. He's very much a part of the team, he's very much a part of the furniture. He put some great performances in last season, and you feel that George Russell's only gonna get, you know, stronger and stronger. I'm not saying that, you know, Lewis is sort of flatlined. But it's just going to be very interesting to see. I think we're seeing that George can challenge Lewis. I think I'm not saying he's better, but we know that George can challenge Lewis. So if you've got a championship contending car, you throw that into the mix, their their partnership is going to become strained. Let's go back to his um, Lewis Hamilton's partnership with Nico Rosberg. They were good friends. You know, we saw them sort of hugging each other when they was on the when they both appeared on the podium. I think it was like two thirds in an eight. You you throw a championship winning car in the, in the process, you know, all of a sudden they're not, they're not friends anymore. We saw one of the greatest rivalries we've seen in recent times. So it just shows how much a championship winning car can change the dynamic within a team. Yeah, very true. And I think that was something last season that I felt with George Russell, that whilst he was consistently very, very good, that in the second half of the season where, you know, the, the car was struggling, you know, he'd gotten into a much faster car from the Williams and, you know, Mercedes were struggling by the normal standards. But whilst George was able to live with that and get the most out of it compared to Sir Lewis, as that car got better and better and better, Sir Lewis obviously went with that in performance. And we saw more of what he was capable of in the second half of the season where George, for the most you know point, couldn't really live with him in terms of outright performance with the exception of Brazil. And even to a degree there, Sir Lewis was a little bit quicker than George. Um, but George obviously got the job done in that race. And... That's something I think George is going to have to work on. I think as the car improves over the course of the season, his peaks will have to get higher and higher and higher in order to you know, match or even beat the level of his teammate. The one thing he has got going for him that I would say throughout Lewis Hamilton's entire career that he's not always been able to master is the fact that George Russell is very, very good in a one-lap situation when conditions aren't great, there's not much experience on track, he can just go and put that lap together right away. So Lewis does have to build himself up. That being said, Lewis has this amazing ability, um, whether he does it in Q1 or Q2, mostly in Q3. If he has one chance, he usually nails it when he has to. And I, you know, I've you know, i never known a guy be more clutch at doing that um, than Sir Lewis. You know, I know we talk about the Schumachers and the Vettels. Yeah, they were great too, but Lewis is outstanding when it comes to mm-hmm. stuff like that. So there is a nice mix there um, that I'm sure will you know present itself in 2023. Lee, in terms of what George Russell needs to do next season, you know, we've gone over a few bits already, but this is another opportunity for George on the back of technically beating his teammate to really try and solidify his alphaness. I suppose if that's a word or the right way of putting it in a team that has two very strong alpha characters in it already. Are they changing teams? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I can raise this one. Not for the short term anyway. <laughs> um, well, for, for George, is obviously carry on what he's doing. He's obviously had it a great season last season and that was only his first season in that team. So they're just those steps in that the direction, obviously making less mistakes because there were a couple of Grand Prix last season where George just kept like ticking things. Singapore comes to mind or Austin. Um, just like, yeah, just put the car everywhere it's not supposed to go. Mm. Um and that's kind of things that, like we talk about, Charles of finding and um, finessing his driving craft. George needs to do that bit of tidying up. Um, the memory comes back to Lewis in 2011, where whatever Lewis could do, or whatever Lewis did, he, his front wing always collected the rear of Massa's car. Mm. Don't know how he did it, but he stopped it in 2012. Well, those two were magnetised to each other. Yeah, that yeah, oh, yeah they were, but it was always <laughs> Lewis's front wing to the back of Felipe's car, and not the other way around or anything. It was always <laughs> <front wing. laughs> so. Yeah. It's that that Jewel just needs to tidy up those little errors that just destroy our whole race weekend. Um, I think that's really the big key thing for George and signs. Um, yeah, <laughs> well, I think that's more gravel traps. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, start the season ended up being George Russell's front yeah. wing in the second half of the season, but you know we'll gloss over that. Yeah, um, but. I think George also needs to be aware of is the inter-team rivalry 
and not so much the rivalry itself, but the overtaking on the track. We haven't had much of a situation where Lewis and George are fighting for a race win, right? Yes, Brazil was getting there, but Lewis wasn't close enough to to actually be in a, a, a fight of overtaking back and forth, lap after lap. Um, and we know Lewis is very good at overtaking. And we know what kind of situation happens with Max. We know the kind of situation that happened with Nico. Um, and you can just, I just have the feeling that if there was a, a title fight between the two of them, Lewis, at least the first season, would have the upper hand because he would unstabilize George in the way the ruthlessness Lewis will deploy on the track. And you just saw Nico in the first season, it completely destroyed him in, in regards to Nico always backed out. Lewis always had the track position. Nico was forced out until that infamous collision in Barcelona where Nico's like, that's enough. I'm, yeah. I'm not going to give away anymore. And I think that will catch George out um, when not obviously colliding with Lewis, but the the first real fight on track between the two of them, I think that really uh, will affect George. And I think he needs to be aware of that. Yeah, no, I think so too. And it's one of those where you kind of have to look at what's going on here between the two of them in the team. Now, you know, things seem rather peaceful and rather amicable right now. We know eventually that there is going to be a battle for dominance at this team. And this could come at a point where Sir Lewis has made up his own mind, decided that this is going to be his last season. Mercedes then have to start looking to the future. Now, of course, in their short-term future, over the next few years, if it's George Russell and Sir Lewis Hamilton, then that's great. They'd want that. But at the point where Sir Lewis decides, right, this is where I need to call it a day, George Russell has to demonstrate that he is ready to take over and not just take over once Lewis goes. He has to take over straight away. And Mercedes will obviously invest more time and effort into George and things will start to tip over into his favour. But he has to return that in kind by putting the performances together. Now, I'm under no illusions that if George Russell next season goes and beats Lewis Hamilton, that Lewis is not suddenly washed up. He's not mid. You know, he's going to come back. He's going to be ruthless. He's going to be relentless. He's going to want to get back. And Lewis will have this amazing ability to probably go and do that. In George's mind, he has to make sure that when the time comes, when he has to pick and choose his moments to really put his foot down and be that alpha character in the team, he has to deliver on that as well. And he has to live with what Sir Lewis can throw at him to prove to Mercedes that he's the future. Because the last thing that he wants is for Sir Lewis to say, okay, I'm going to call it a day, I've had enough. And then Mercedes look at George in the same way that they looked at Bottas in that he's good, but he's a bit B+. He's not quite the next guy. And they're going to be sniffing around for whoever that could be, whether that be Leclerc or, you know, heaven forbid, I suppose, Verstappen. That would be quite an interesting Mm -hmm. partnership and F1 would be over for good because Max and Mercedes would just dominate and like Lewis did, I suppose. Um, You know, there are other characters as well that I could name. So it's certainly one that I'm going to be very much intrigued by. Um, I mean, Courtney, have you got any more to add on that one before we move on? No, you've both touched on it with the sort of heat that comes with, you know, being in a battle with Lewis. Um, Nico Rosberg admitted himself that that's what led to him retiring so early. He he won that championship and he's like, I'm out. I can't do this anymore. And it's 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 the like, you can imagine the intensity. So on track, you know, when even behind the scenes, and also look, it, it, it's. I, I don't agree with it, but it's also the heat that comes from Lewis Hamilton's fan base as well. I don't I don't like that from, you know, the online stuff, but that is an aspect that drivers, unfortunately, have to deal with in this day and age. If you end up in the championship, you can ask Max Verstappen as well. If you end up in the championship battle against Lewis Hamilton, a lot of heat comes your way, both on and off track. So that's something that George Russell will have to potentially mentally prepare himself for. And it's, it's a big ask. Yeah, it is a big ask. And, you know, we saw some of it already. I remember the other day I was saying to um, one of our guests, Lucy, who was on the show uh, a little while ago, that there was a photo doing the rounds of George Russell and Fernando Alonso dancing with each other in a club. I think had cigars or something jokey like that. And the amount of responses that were attacking Alonso and George Russell that were coming from certain fans, you know, not necessarily Lewis Hamilton fans, but very much in defiance of that thinking, are we just trying to start a rivalry here through through this or are we just going to let them do it out on the track? Because it it just gets a bit silly. And, you know, I'd like to think that eventually we're going to move away from this, but it just keeps rearing itself again and again and again. But it's certainly fun to talk about and we'll have to wait and see how things turn out this season. Let's talk about Red Bull. 
Now, Red Bull were the pace setters last season, and, you know, there's a lot of talk between Max and Checo, how that unfolded towards the end of last season. Red Bull ultimately not getting a 1-2 in the Drivers' Championship wasn't really because of that, but they may look back on the season and think there were certain moments where they could have allowed Checo to have the result that might have got in P2. This season might be a little bit different between how they race each other. But one thing I do want to ask about with Red Bull, being the dominant team, having that advantage, having the dominance that they had that a lot of people will tip them to be favourites for 2023, the real question is going to be, how much will the cost cap breach affect them? How much will the punishments from last year's cost cap breach affect them this season? Will it affect them? When will it affect them? What are we thinking on this one, guys? Would it be enough to tip the scales to one of their rivals? Uh, possibly. Uh, depends how close the uh, the competition is. Um, I, I I reckon the effects of the uh, the cost cap will probably play part more when it comes to development of this year's car and and maybe um, to an extent the twenty twenty four car. So yeah, I, I, if if we have a close championship battle, then you'd think yeah, absolutely it will. But if Red Bull have come up with another uh, sort of sneaky innovation, it gives them that big advantage at the beginning of the season, and the other teams are, are playing catch up. That's when it could you know become you know an issue for the other teams. So I think it all depends on how far Red Bull are ahead, if they indeed are at the beginning of the um, season and obviously pre season testing. What do you reckon, Lee? Because Courtney made a good point there about the 2024 car and it may affect them a little bit more there. Is it possible it might affect them sooner? Because I'm kind of working on, you know, it's not necessarily affected them too much right now, but Red Bull right now for development parts that may not be on the car for another six months or something perhaps a little bit earlier than that, there's going to be very much a tunnel vision effect where they're going to be not necessarily um, not being able to develop certain parts, but the freedom and the time and investment that they would have normally had if they hadn't breached the budget cap, they're not going to be afforded all of that next season. So I feel like this is something that could hinder them in the second half of the season, especially if we end up with a freeway title fight between Ferrari themselves and Mercedes. I think it will hinder them. Um, if it hinders them as much as Christian Horner said it, it well, I don't know, but I think they're, it's going to hinder them enough that they're concerned. Uh, they'll be more concerned about Mercedes and Ferrari. And I'm saying Mercedes, not because Mercedes are better, but because they finished third in the Constructors' Championship. Obviously, the amount of development time and aero time that Mercedes get, um, finished fourth, finishing third in the championship. And Mercedes, we know, are a team that the resource and the, the skill and the knowledge to develop their car. And it's going to be the development, as you said, that's where Red Bull may um, struggle. So I think they'll be really concerned about what Mercedes could potentially do, having that extra surplus over Red Bull as the season goes on. Um, and I think they'll be quite concerned about that gap in development um, time and the aero time and the the oh, I forgot the software, sorry. Um, but the soft, there's also a limitation on obviously their software as well. Mm. Um, oh. The, the name of it escapes me this morning. <laughs> um, but I, I think they'll be concerned on that. Yeah, it'd be like, well, the CFD runs and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, that's it, the CFD. That's, yeah, that's the one. It. Yeah, okay. So that's all good and well. And, you know, whilst Red Bull obviously going to have that to contend with, I think we already talked about this briefly, but the Verstappen-Perez dynamic. Now, if this turns out to be a free car championship, which I sincerely hope that it does, I think a lot of us agree we want Ferrari, Mercedes and Red Bull all fighting each other till the very end this season. That potentially means we're going to have six drivers fighting for this 2023 World Championship. I sincerely hope, again, that this turns out to be the you case. You mean five drivers? Five drivers. <laughs> sorry, excuse me. Yes, one of which, and uh, sorry, Sergio Perez fan. Sorry. <laughs> but um, Lee, you know, Lee does make a good point. Um, Red Bull are certainly not going to be back in Perez to win this championship unless something crazy happens with Verstappen where, you know, that Perez ends up being the number one guy. But whilst Mercedes... Obviously, you have two alphas in their team, which means that they're going to take points off each other, but their Constructors' Championship is going to look very good. In a way, Ferrari kind of do that, except rather than instruct the drivers to do it and they don't do it, they just don't do anything. So Ferrari will just meddle their own up, own mess up, I suppose. Red Bull will actually have the best dynamic in terms of what they would want their team to be in an established number one and an established number two. The problem is the two of them don't get along anymore, or at least they don't in the same way that they used to. And Perez, obviously, 
he's probably not going to be so keen to let Max go through as he was last season. So with all that being said, guys, could this be the thing that unhinges Red Bull this season if we end up with a free team title fight? Yeah, if you have a look at, you know, as I described Red Bull um, earlier on in the episode, the almost flawless machine that this team is at the moment, you are going to be looking at the dynamic and um, after the incident um, where Max didn't uh, give Sergio a chance. Um, I, it was it was unnecessary. And we said at the time it could potentially hinder the team. And it is going to be really intriguing. Again, if, if Sergio Perez has a good start to the season, for whatever reason, Max has gremlins understanding how to get the best setup from the car. It's going to be interesting to see how that how that dynamic transpires, particularly if they are in a tight championship battle and there, there could be a situation where Sergio Perez is leading the championship, but the team deep down want to give Max a chance. That I think we can all agree that's where things could potentially go wrong. But the only way that's going to happen is if Sergio Perez up, ups his game and becomes a bit more of a challenge to Max because yeah I think we can we again we can all agree that Max had it a bit too easy last season it was almost as if he was playing F1 on easy mode yeah very much i mean that belgian grand prix was absolutely ridiculous the fact that he got from last to first in basically a handful of laps quite frankly um lee What's your take on this one with Verstappen and Perez? I mean, Courtney already made a good point. Verstappen was absolutely dominant last season, so that even if Perez didn't really help him when he needed to, Verstappen still would have won the championship by a comfortable margin. But if we end up with that three-way title fight, could this brewing dynamic of uh, you know tension between the two really turn out to be Red Bull's undoing rather than a cost cap breach? For me, there's one race that I think could be the undoing of Red Bull. Um, is Monaco. Even a barring surprise that Sergio comes out of the block and actually beats Max before we reach Monaco, I think Monaco has the potential to really upset the balance within the team. And I'm saying that because obviously the stories that came out after the, uh, Brazil was there was all because of Max believes Sergio crashed on purpose based on what conversations they had behind closed doors. Obviously, that's not been a um, confirmed at all but that's just the the, the current um, feeling so for example we get to Monaco um, and Sergio is on it does Max crash the car to stop Sergio as a bit of revenge and get his pole position does Sergio crash the car again to keep pole position if he's sitting in um, uh, it, after their first run in P1 and provisionally pole so if that scenario happens Imagine the ramifications of Sergio Max. So he crashed on purpose to stop me getting it. And, or Max Sergio crashed on, and bam, that's it. That's the season gone. That's their comrade gone. That's it. They're, they're not going to work as teammates. And I think it's all going to be about what happens in Monaco for me. Um, and if they crash on purpose, although they would never admit that, that's the accusations that would be thrown about. And, and I think that's where we'll see what happens with Red Bull and their driver pairing. I mean, running the risk of having the British bias and Hamilton fanboy bias thrown at us again here. Can we see Max Verstappen doing that next season? Because, I mean, I like the guy. I think he's a fantastic driver, but I certainly can't rule it out. I can't rule out Max doing what Perez did last year to a degree or doing a Schumacher or Rosberg at Raskas. And uh, yeah, I, I, I can't rule it out, unfortunately. Yeah, it all depends on how flustered Max gets because obviously it, last season was easy for him and we uh, that's the one weakness in Max's game. He can get flustered. Other drivers can get in his head. We've seen that easily flustered he can get. So again, if we go in a situation where Max doesn't start the season as well as he wants to and we know how high pressure Monaco is, to, just to keep that car out of the wall takes a lot of concentration obviously a lot of skill, so much pressure. And we do often see in championship battles that Monaco is the place. When you get towards Monaco, Barcelona, that's where the needle starts to build between the two drivers. So, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Monaco is where things get tasty between those two drivers. Yeah, 
I mean, to be honest, I don't really care how bad that goes as long as Charles Leclerc wins the race in Monaco. I mean, he has to win at Monaco Surely. at some point. Has to I mean, win he has there. to finish the race. <laughs> he, finished there. he did finish last season. Yeah, but don't do it once. Yeah, well, That's yeah. Only once. He needs to do it again. Well, I mean, it wasn't <laughs> easy, yeah, but, uh, you know, what can you do? Lee, you've decided to be a troll tonight, haven't you? It's not good. <laughs> it's not Sorry, good, man. L, L's in the chat for uh, Leclerc, unfortunately, because of Lee. So uh, there's a trend going on there. L for Lee, L for Leclerc, L for Monaco, just because it deserves it, even though it hasn't got an L in it. Um, let's move on to Aston Martin. This is going to be an interesting one for them because mm-hmm. last season, you know, the season ended rather well. They were very unlucky not to beat... Alfa Romeo in the Constructors' Championship. But this is a team that's going to go from strength to strength. There's a lot being made on this project, and I've got a great episode lined up for you guys to listen to regarding the Aston Martin project in the near future. So that hopefully that will shed some more light on what we're going with here. But I think in the short term, Aston Martin for next season surely have to be targeting being top of that midfield battle, at least a P4, maybe even a P5, perhaps, what do we think, guys? This is the team that's made steps forward, particularly in the last half of last season. So, you know, make the right steps forward. You certainly can't rule it out that Aston Martin could end up being kings in the midfield. Yeah, I've, they can. And I, you, you get the feeling that with Fernando Alonso, guy, all hinges on Fernando. Um, you'd think with a lot of the bad choices Fernando Alonso has made for his career, there's cost him multiple world championships. Let's be honest, look, he's up there with the Hamiltons and the Vettels on pure ability. He should be more than a two-time world champion. But the decisions he's made, my God, have really sort of held him back. You'd like to think he must know something about this Aston Martin project that's made him want to, you know, leave an Alpine team where, you know, he was was doing a great job for the team. It's the, it's the third time he's been there. It's like his second home. For him to leave that so abruptly as well, he must know something. The way that when Lewis Hamilton moved to Mercedes, it raised a lot of eyebrows, including my own, I can't lie. And we know, obviously, the rest speaks for itself. So maybe Fernando knows something about this project. And it's also the dynamic with Stroll. I'm, I'm sure it's something we're going to move on to. But that, that for me, is one of the partnerships that really sort of I'm sort of glued on going into this season. Yeah, I mean, these are two drivers that are no strangers to having incidents with each other. Of course, we very much remember the race in Austin last season where Fernando nearly got sent flying and and somehow managed to keep it all together and recover it. It's going to be a very interesting dynamic between those two. We're going to a team that Stroll very much had everything that he could have possibly have wanted. Not going to really question the guy's motivational character, but from what I've heard, there are other drivers that have definitely put more miles in or seem more focused on the smaller nuances and smaller one percents, if you like, um, to get the most out of their car than him. And with someone like Fernando Alonso, who's going to be absolutely ruthless, he's going to demand everything, perhaps you know, compared to someone like Sebastian Vettel who was just happy to have what he was having towards the end of his career. So it's going to be fun to watch. Um, Lee, what are your thoughts on this one with Aston Martin? I mean, we talked about Stroll and Alonso, but, you know, going back to the earlier point, this 2026 project that they have to try and be competitive and be world champions, maybe, the next step surely has to be moving up the midfield and trying to assert themselves as the next best team behind the top three. Well, there's two points I want to make of the the potential for this year's midfield fight is so for me so juicy that's more it's out it's almost more appealing whatever happens at the front because we potentially could have four teams fighting over fourth um which well it could be more but it's very likely mm. it could be four teams fighting over fourth which is just wow what a midfield fight we're going to be in for if that does happen um and that obviously includes Aston Martin in that in that fight um, but also was something I observed over the, the Christmas break um, where I was visiting family in Spain is the, the Spanish media uh, 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 after interviewing with Fernando Alonso uh, uh, Fernando is quite certain that he's going to be fighting for top five finishes um, from the get-go I mean top five I mean the top three teams already take top six positions so which top team are they expecting a fight for to get a top five finish um, I don't know the answer to that one. 
Um, I think a top Fernando five. Fernando will be hoping it's Mercedes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of <course> he will. <laughs> um, but he's the, the the I think that's probably a stretch to be fighting for a top five, but I definitely feel like you said it, he knows something or they believe they've got a very good car for this year. Um to have that kind of leaking into the, the Spanish media about how fighting or how feisty or how good this Kirsten Martin will be. Or we could all be disappointed and it's all a, a load of hype and it's uh, terrible when they get a B-spec car in Barcelona. So, but it's definitely a, a mouth in the potential. I mean, there's a lot going on there. You know, they've got some great people there like Andy Green, Dan Fellows on the technical side. Obviously, that was a big move at the time when he left Red Bull in the way that he did. And, you know, Lawrence Stroll has been back in this project. There's all the new infrastructure pr- projects going on at Aston Martin, the new wind tunnel, the new facilities, the new factory. It's going to be up there with anything that we've seen, perhaps beyond that. And of course, that new technology and equipment is going to trump everything that we've seen before by the time it all gets produced to the point where in 2026, they could be fighting for world championships. There's a lot of pressure in the interim to try and progress as far up the field as possible so that they have a good base. And I think with a driver lineup with like Alonso and Stroll, there aren't too many differences between that and what they had last season with Sebastian Vettel. But unlike Sebastian Vettel, we've got a guy who's absolutely ruthless, hungry to succeed, despite the fact that he's done everything he needs to do to have a respective legendary career in the sport. And you pair that up with someone who, again, is obviously going to want everything that they can get from this team, and it's probably going to be handed to him. But Aston Martin have to balance that because Fernando is not going to sit there and just let, for example, if Stroll gets an upgrade, if there's one available and Stroll gets over Alonso, that's Alonso's not going to allow that. Vettel might have done, but Fernando certainly isn't. So I'm just curious to see how Lawrence Stroll and those beneath him, like Mike Crack and Dan Fallows and Andy Green, how are they all going to manage that? I mean, it does seem like a recipe for chaos. It's what you get with Fernando. You, you, get, you get the pace, but you also get the drama. I mean, that's what I want to see. Fernando and Lawrence Stroll clashing, honestly. Um, literally, I can, I can just imagine a scene, and look, I'm not trying to knock Lance Stroll here, but you've got Fernando Alonso probably doing something or saying something, and you've got Lance Stroll, like the kid who's telling his dad which person picked on him at school or something like that, when he's the original bully <laughs> in the first place. And Fernando just like, don't care. That's the clash I want to see, Lawrence Stroll and Fernando Alonso, like two mega auras. And we're talking about the team principal that probably has the biggest aura going, where he walks into a room, you feel the man's presence. Fernando Alonso, that's going to be an interesting battle. How someone who doesn't, you know, mince his words and he says what's on his mind, whether it's to the detriment of his own career or his team, that remains to be seen. But, um, I mean, that, that could be as fiery and as explosive as the World Championship battle itself. I mean, just imagine two standing in the pit lane, Lawrence and Fernando, both pointing fingers in Benito style at each other. Oh, they'll be doing more than just that. Yeah. They'll be doing more than just that. I could be, I could see some uh, carbon fiber bits being thrown around or stuff like that. But uh, I'd, yeah, I know one thing. You're looking at some of these driver partnerships. We, you, you, be pretty sure that the uh, the drive to survive teams are rubbing their hands in glee. I tell you what, even though they love to edit races out of context, they don't need to. Just go with raw footage behind the scenes and it'll be an absolute blockbuster. Honestly, guys, don't know about you, but I am buzzing to see these dynamics transpire this year. Oh, there are a few teams. You could happily make a documentary and follow their progress throughout the year that I'd rather watch than drive to survive. Yeah. Aston Martin in 23 is definitely going to be one of them. Haas is always one just because of Gunther. We love Gunther. And you've got Kevin Magnussen and Hulkenberg being teammates again. We'll talk about that in the next episode when we cover some of the other stories. Um, There are certainly a few teams like that. I think the last thing we do need to talk about before we sign off for this particular part of the 2023 Big Stories episode, uh, Andretti, the news with them. Now, I talked about this with uh, Planet F1 journalist Sam Cooper the other day. Of course, if you haven't checked that out, make sure it's on the channel, on your favourite podcasting platforms. It's there for you. So definitely give that a listen. Andretti Cadillac with the help of General Motors. Now, this is an exciting potential entry onto the Formula One grid. Andretti, for all of the boxes that they ticked beforehand, they never really had the backing of a big racing Uh, motor car manufacturer they have that now the american f1 dream very much is alive with this collaboration what are you guys thoughts on this one because i didn't get to talk to you both on this one yeah 
is this something that could be realistic by 2026? Are you excited by this? Is this what America needs mm-hmm. in, in the form of an F1 team? It's it's realistic. It's it's exciting if it comes to fruition. Um, I, I, I feel that F1 does need another engine manufacturer. I think there's too much reliance on the uh, four that we currently have. Um, I just think that would give impetus for you know more teams to join because as i said the the manufacturer market is saturated in f1 at the moment they're all pretty much level as well um I've, obviously for the american market you know the guys at the very top of formula one are really putting impetus on the american market three races in we've got in america now the american audience we know is growing at quite a rate uh particularly because of the uh the the Netflix series is sort of bringing a new audience into the sport. So there's definitely a market now for an American influence in Formula One. I hope it happens, but I just get the feeling like with everything in Formula One, every, everything is so highly politically charged that I feel that we're going to drag on and hear rumours go on for a long time. Me, I just want it to be sorted quickly. Let's get this new influence into Formula One because I just feel that with more teams, comes more opportunity for young drivers. We're missing out on so much young talent at the moment, or we're seeing a delay of young talent coming through to the sport because of the limited opportunities that we have. So for me personally, I'd like to see a return. Barring Monaco, I feel that 24 drivers on the grid was a bit of an issue. I'd love to see 24 drivers be given the opportunity. Because you you think about back then when you had um, the 24 drivers, it gave drivers like Joe Bianchi, God rest his soul, that gave him the opportunity to make his mark in the sport. So I just feel for the sake of the young drivers, come on, let's get some new teams in. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more on that one, actually. Um, Lee, what did you make of all of this? And, and in addition as well, a lot of the teams were asked about this. I think nine out of 10 of them pushed back on this, saying they weren't a fan of expanding the grid. They didn't want Andretti to come on the grid. Uh, I think the only one that did want Andretti on the grid was Alpine. And I think that's mostly down to the fact that Renault are going to be potentially supplying Andretti with engines for 2026 beyond that. If Andretti do get accepted onto the F1 grid, again, a lot of if and buts and maybes. What I'm saying right now is not necessarily reported, confirmed facts. This is just uh, speculation at this point. Mohamed Ben Salayim as well saying that, you know, the F1 team's aren't really understanding the bigger picture here and that this isn't all just about money, which is exactly what Mario and Michael Andretti, who's head of Andretti Global, are basically saying that this is all about money for the existing teams. They just want to protect their piece of the pie yeah. rather than bring new teams in. I mean, what did you make of all of this? Well, firstly, I'll start uh, as a fan. I completely agree with Corny um, that having a 24 was a, a nice number. Um, and as a as a, a, a new team coming in, it's not like a caterer in Russia that they're not going to be able to race under a a budget cap that never came to fruition. There's a budget cap. It's a very well funded mm-hmm. team. They've got the financial resources. They've already proved they've got the, the financial backing to go and meet the budget cap. And they've got someone willing to pay the 200 million entry fee that all the other teams agreed for other teams to come in. So they met all the requirements the other teams agreed to for any new entrance when they decide to bring in new entrance into the sport. So I think that it should be an obvious yes that they should be bringing this team in um, and get an extra two drivers on the grid. I mean, I'm not saying Daniel Ricciardo will go to a new new team, but it would be another option that where we had such a good driver having to go to reserve seat, mm-hmm. he, now, he now would have another option before deciding to go to reserve seat. Or we lost Nico Hulkenberg for a couple of years. There would have been another um, team for him to potentially look at. Or we've got Mick Schumacher going to reserve Mercedes, another team. And they, these are good drivers that deserve their space in Formula One. Mm-hmm. So having those extra four seats, as, as Courtney mentioned, I think we should be, we, as fans, we should be crying out for. Um, obviously, the the second point of the like the money, it's all down to money. Recent articles now that teams are saying 200 million is not enough. They need to be paying six, 700 million to protect the, the financial investment because the sport's growing so much, 200 million is no longer worth it. They need to pay that extra cash up front, or it's got to be a certain amount over five years. That Ooh. is like 
this is the to annoying thing. To compensate a loss. This is the annoying thing, though, isn't it? Because originally the 200 million, we talked about this in the last episode, and this was originally a short-term deterrent. But nobody thought anyone was going to pay that up. It's something that could have even been waived if this 11th team or 12th team could prove to have some value that they would bring to the sport, which would improve them long term. But the problem was, it's 20 million split, split 20, 10 ways. And on top of all of that, it's not a long term investment. It's just a one off payment. So it covers him in the short term. But if this team dilutes the, the brand and you know, crashes and burns, you know, no, no pun intended, of course, probably a poor choice of words on that part, but that they end up falling out of the sport is probably a better way of putting it. It does affect them. So for me, I think you have to take, and, and not to interrupt, but you have to take the choice out of their hands now. I don't think that F1 teams right now should have a say in this purely mm-hmm. and simply yeah. because they're now changing their stance on this. Now they know Andretti have a backer all of a sudden it's 600, it's 700 million, or it has to be sustained funding. It's like, you're kind of just proving guys that whilst I get you're trying to protect your businesses right now, this is exactly why I think we need another team in this sport, you know, because they're not thinking about the sport, nor should they, they should be thinking about themselves, of course. But I think when you come to making decisions like this, you've got to think about the fans. And I think long-term, this does make sense from a business perspective, because you get to a point as you know, Sam said on the show that Americans are going to catch on and think, oh, well, you're only interested in our money. You're not interested in us getting involved in the sport. Exactly. Yeah. And one of the other things that I want to add on about the Andretti that teams have said is, oh, because he plans to do it all in the US, hire American engineers, hire American designers. Um, But uh, the Formula One's in Europe. All all the teams are in the UK, or if not Italy, apart from obviously um, Alfa Romeo. And being in the US, even Haas has a base in the UK and Italy and the headquarters in the US can't be completely based in the US. How ridiculous. That's not what Formula One's about. Why not? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if, they, if they can Spot pay on. it and then get the staff members that are American and obviously not, obviously if people can get the visas and whatnot, you work in Europe, we work in the US. I'm not stopping any of that. But obviously teams are complaining, oh, because no one would go and work in the US. If you've got American people that are willing to be based in America and designer and can be competitive and have the funding. I do not see a problem in that. So I think that another argument from the teams are completely irrelevant. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you on that one. But uh, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, as I said, I, I don't think the team should ever say in this, quite frankly. I think if the criteria is set for this expression of interest when they put the applications out and Andressi passed all of the tests, and bear in mind, Liberty Media are obviously going to be keeping an eye on this as well because they've done a lot to try and promote F1 as a business and have done a great job with that, they're obviously going to want an American team involved. So if it works, then hopefully this is a good thing for F1. We need more teams on the grid. Um, I think, you know, we've had 10 teams for too long and I think they've had too much of a say in regards to this expansion. So we'll have to wait and see. I'm excited by it. I hope it comes to fruition. We'll just have to wait and see. Guys, I think that's all we've got time for for this one. We're going to do a part two. I think before we even went on air, we knew that there was a lot to talk about. So we weren't going to cover this all in one episode. So if you join us in a few days time, we will be back for part two, where we'll cover the other remaining stories in the other teams. And of course, talk a little bit about the F1 calendar, because of course, there are rumors going around that we may end up with a Chinese Grand Prix after all, or possibly another race at Portimao. That was another race that was rumored as well, amongst some of the other big stories heading into the 2023 season. But as always, of course, make sure to support us by giving us a like on the video, subscribing to the channel, and giving us a five-star review on your favorite podcast and platform. Of course, if you think we're worthy of one, we'll give you a shout out on the next episode as a reward for that one. But until next time, guys, please do stay safe. And uh, thanks for listening. And we'll see you in the next episode of the DNF1 F1 podcast. Remember one thing, if you're not first, you're probably DNF1. Take care. See you soon. Goodbye.